I watched this whole video And everything about it bothers me I think egg salad is the most disgusting thing that exists And if you eat it, I'm sorry But to put it in some weird fried sliced bread taco I think that is disgusting Good morning, sweet world, and welcome to the No Dunks Podcast on the Athletic Network, a fine network. It's Friday, October 13th, 2023. Spooky. I'm Jay E. Skeets here in the Classic Factory. To my left, it's the bearded one, my top shot hot boy, Trey Kirby. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. And over yonder, the man making the magic happen, super producer, JD. Hello. There he is, and here we are. Quick update on our guy, Tass. This past Wednesday, he was discharged from the rehab center here in Atlanta. Doctors and therapists uh, giving Tass the okay to head home, where he'll now continue all of his therapy sessions as an outpatient. So, huge step. I mean, I would like to say he's taking baby steps, but this guy's taking like <laughs> triple jump Mike Conley Sr. leaps. That's a reference for you old heads out there. Mike Conley Sr., triple jump uh, expert. Probably gold medalist, I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. He's, uh, <laughs> he's a real Jordan Kilgannon out there with the way he's making these major leaps. <laughs> well, I guess he he went up. He mostly, went up. But forward, nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we still don't really know when Tass will be back. But, yeah. man, what a great step uh, for him to go home and be with his family again. Awesome stuff. Awesome, awesome stuff. So there's a great, great Tass update. Shout out to the stream team for joining us live here on YouTube. Smash that like button. Subscribe. Share the show as we get closer and closer to the start of the NBA season. Really, it's the start of no dunks. Let's be honest. I know it's a Friday here, but starting on Monday, it's season preview time, and we are full on basically five days a week, sometimes six shows a week, uh, with the season starting like basically in two weeks. Uh, so, yeah, buckle up. The boys are back. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, on today's pod, we got a little Is This News? We're going to talk about Channing Fry watching a movie on an airplane, <laughs> and he called it a rhino turd. We'll talk about it later. Uh, Leave and, your and guess so for more. what movie you think is the rhino turd. <laughs> yeah, don't cheat. Yeah. Don't cheat, but in the uh, stream team right now, what movie did Channing Fry call a rhino turd? <laughs> and, you know, I'm jumping ahead here, but basically said he could film his dog taking a crap <laughs> with the budget they used on this particular movie, and it would be better. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Hey, we just got uh, off a flight yesterday. We had a quick trip to uh, New York City uh, <laughs> to have some athletic meetings. Um, did you guys watch anything? I watched the a movie on the plane. Was it a rhino turd? No, there was rhinos in it. Mutated rhinos. Teenage Mutant Ninja hey, Turtles. I watched that yeah. too. Mayhem. Um, did you like it? Banger. I thought it was awesome. Absolute banger. Yeah. I loved it. Not just the total nostalgia play, which I liked. I thought it was a great movie all around. Yeah. And JD, did you uh, consume any media on uh, on these airplanes that we were on? Yeah, I consumed no media. <laughs> I sat and stewed for the entire flight. You at yeah. the flight tracker? Putty, putty style, straight ahead. <laughs> Something happened, and I'm very minor, and I just stewed about it the whole flight. And I don't want to get into it. Oh, is it, well, you're saving it for is this good, I assume. I guess. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but now's not the time. I'm still I'm still pissed How about do it. you feel about people watching the flight tracker on a flight? <laughs> I hate it. You do it all the time. I was watching you check it five times. I know, but it's so stupid because like, it's like literally you know, a, a watch pot never boils. I yeah. mean, that's like the definition of this. It's like we're never going to land if I just keep watching this stupid little <laughs> thing move. Watch I mean, I fire wins. it up when I have to piss. Like, I'm like, should I unbuckle, unplug, or do do I just wait? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how close are we to uh, okay. Let me check in with the cockpit okay, here. That's it. it. Okay. Yeah. All so right. I do check it from time to time. Okay. Well, we are back, and we are excited uh, because we are starting uh, today's No Dunks podcast with uh, the NBA GM survey. Yes, our guy, John Schumann. This is his baby. He does this every year. I think he said this is, what, the 21st, 22nd year of doing right, this? Yeah. Incredible stuff from Shu. Uh, the NBA's annual general manager survey. It was released earlier this week, 
Uh, and like always, it gets me sort of hyped uh, for the start of the season because when it drops, you know we're close. But yeah. we like to go through this and pick out a couple of the questions that Schumann asks the GMs and some of the responses we get because, you know, he's testing every single one of them or he's getting their answers to this. And some of the results are, you know, perplexing or at least surprising. So let's just start with the big one, the first one. Uh, which team will win the 2024 NBA Finals? Again, this question is sent to all these GMs. And uh, our results here, and we're showing them to everybody on YouTube, it was a tie. The Boston Celtics and the Denver Nuggets getting 33% of the vote to win the 2024 NBA Finals. And then the Bucks coming in third, 23%. And then a vote or two going, obviously, to the Suns and the Clippers. Um, surprised at all by this, TK? I'm not surprised that those are the top four teams okay. for who would be most likely to win the championship this year. Because I think we all agree, Bucks and Celtics in the East, the Nuggets are defending champions out West, and the Suns have a whole bunch of talent that we're looking forward to seeing how they all meld together. So it makes sense to me that those are the top four. I am a little curious about when the question was asked and when people decided to vote for the Celtics over the Bucks if they had had been asked a week prior was it bucks over celtics right. who knows uh but yeah i do think those are probably when we get to doing our preseason tiers those are likely the four teams we will have in the top championship contending tier and i would say the fifth team would not be the clippers <laughs> no that was a surprise to me coming in fifth seven percent of the votes which i guess math wise is what two votes does that make sense well the clippers got three percent oh three percent so they somebody one, one vote, vote. yeah, yeah. Who did that? That was foolish. It should be the Lakers. The Lakers should come in at fifth there. I think they had a better season than the Clippers. You have reliability concerns with LeBron and AD, just like you do with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, though not to the same extent. And the Lakers were just better than the Clippers last year, and they're bringing everybody back, plus the additions they made uh, over the summer. So if we're talking L.A. teams, I would have uh, Lakers over Clippers, certainly. But, yeah, I'm not mad at the top four. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I think a lot of people, from what I've seen, because this, again, came out on Tuesday, so there's been a lot of articles and podcasts on and stuff like that, uh, some people shocked with the Celtics being tied with the Nuggets and being higher than the Bucks. Uh, that seems to be the biggest, like, whoa, you know, they're getting a lot of respect here from the GMs. But then you step back, and you're like, okay, yes, they lost some pieces. Defensive-minded guys, like in Smart and, and Grant Williams and Time Lord, of course, so they struggled to play. Uh, and then they... Add another great defensive guy, though, in Drew Holiday, and then Porzingis sort of more of an offensive guy, but maybe some rim protection. So people are like, well, are they going to take a step back defensively? But, again, you zoom out, this team is always in the mix. Yeah. You've got the Jays. You're always in the mix. And uh, it makes sense that they would be at least on the short list. And, sure, if you want to have the Bucks as the 33% chance over the Celtics, no one's going to be upset with that after getting Damian Lillard, but... They got the right teams here besides the Clippers getting one vote. Who the hell did that? <laughs> you can't vote for Who your own you? team, I assume. Or can you? Shu, can you? I don't You're think you can. Chat. I don't oh. think you can. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Uh, the Celtics, to me, they got to be a championship contender. But of all the uh, between the Bucks and the Clippers, I think the Bucks definitely are changing things up with Damian Lillard for Drew Holiday. So they're more offense-focused than defense-focused, certainly, uh, compared to the past. But the Celtics have had way more changes. Like you're mentioning, all of the guys that have been important for the Celtics these past few years when they've been going to the conference finals time and time again, they were talked about as the best defensive team in NBA history a couple of seasons back when they made their run to the finals, and now they are going complete flip-flop. They're going almost all offense right now, I feel like, though the Drew Holiday uh, addition certainly changes that a little bit. But it seems like a big-time change in philosophy to me for the Celtics compared to what we've seen uh, the past couple of seasons. Weird that Drew Holiday came off the bench, I think, in his first couple of preseason games. Like, you just traded all this for this guy who everybody, the GMs consider the best perimeter defender in the league, and right. you're bringing him off the bench? I don't think that's a smart move, but it's also the preseason. Yeah. That will change over time. Uh, but, yeah, you look at all these teams, shallow teams, right? Like, yeah. you're talking about top sixes only, uh, basically, at least for the top three championship-wise. Top three, I guess, if you're looking at the Suns and then whoever else is going to hit from their hodgepodge of veteran minimum contracts. But uh, the bummer here, or I guess maybe good news for the Lakers, I saw Zach Cram at the Ringer did uh, a look back at all these NBA GM surveys. None of the past three champions have received a single preseason vote. Not the Bucks, not the Warriors, not the Nuggets. 
Good news for the Lakers. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I also saw on NBA.com, I don't know if it was Shu or somebody there, they have like links to every single one, and they've done some breakdowns of the numbers when it comes to like, yeah, how often did the GMs get this right? You know, we're always making yeah. our predictions. Sometimes we hit, sometimes we don't, but it's cool to see sort of uh, the consensus from the uh, from the head honchos here in the NBA. Well, let's keep it moving here. I love this next question uh, that we're sort of plucking out of the 50 questions that Shu asked everybody. If you were starting a franchise today, and could sign any player in the NBA, who would it be? Here's the breakdown. Jokic, 33%. He leads the way. But at number two, Victor Wemanyama with the Spurs, 23%. Giannis coming in there at 13%. And then Luka, Anthony Edwards uh, getting a few votes, and then getting one vote, I guess, Curry, Embiid, SGA, and Tatum. Okay, so great names, of course, on this list. But uh, maybe the shocking part is a rookie who's looked incredible in preseason games, <laughs> uh, or at least game, and has another one tonight, I believe, against the Heat. Uh, coming in second there, right behind Jokic, ahead of some other huge names. Yeah, and I think that just shows that this is a question that you can answer a couple of different ways. Do you want to win a championship your first year? Personally, I would. That's good <laughs> job security. So I'm taking Jokic, I'm taking Giannis, and Curry at fifth? That's crazy to me. But right. there's a lot of other teams that are saying, yeah, if I'm building a franchise, I want to have a chance to win championships for 10 years. And in that case, maybe you are taking Victor Wembanyama second, but uh, yeah. it feels sort of like the GMs kind of split the vote here. So you got Jokic on top, Giannis coming third, Curry coming fifth. You know, it's like some of them are win now and some of them are win in the future. Uh, personally, I would have the established players above the rookie, yeah. even though he looked good in his preseason games. I'm still taking the guys who have won championships if so, I'm trying to win a championship. So GM Trey Kirby gets asked this question from Shu. You are saying Jokic is uh, number one today? Yes. Yes. And, and then, okay, let's remove Victor. Who's one, two, three for you? in this starting a franchise today. It sounds like you want to win it now. So what do you go? Do you go Jokic, Giannis, and then Curry still? Or yeah. where do you go? Or LeBron? Yeah. <laughs> Jokic, Giannis, and then Curry. Though I, I'm, you could maybe talk me into Curry at second over Giannis. I don't know. Okay. That, that's a tough call. Uh, but Jokic, Giannis, and Curry to me would be the top three that I would want on my team if I'm trying to win the 24 title. Fair enough. Yeah, Jokic, I mean, <laughs> look, uh, he's the best scorer. Uh, for, on a team that won a championship, Jokic is the Nuggets' best scorer. He's their best rebounder. He's obviously their best passer and is maybe one of the greatest passers we've ever seen in the NBA history. He's probably their best interior defender. I mean, he's like, check, 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 check. He does all this on a team that just won the title. So tough to pick against them, but, I mean, obviously there's a lot of talent in this league. Yeah. Anthony Edwards getting a couple votes, I guess. What is that, two votes maybe there? Uh, to start a franchise round, you can understand why. I would. I think it's still a reach. I'm taking... Heck, I'm still taking someone like SGA and probably Tatum above an Anthony Edwards. Um, but yeah, you're getting a little love. Maybe that's uh, the Team USA bump. GMs love a fourth place finish. <laughs> the GMs love a fourth place finish. If you were trying to finish fourth in the NBA today, who would you take? Maybe Anthony Edwards. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> because they were a play-in team uh, last year. And I mean, Edwards is really good, but... Um, Something that, uh, like, is a general takeaway from the entire GM survey is, like, these guys are just as reactive as we are. Uh, it feels like with the way the hmm. best player in the league switches, like, every single year. If you were the best player on the championship team, guess what? You're the number one player yeah. uh, going into the next season. And, like you're saying, that GMs watched the FIBA World Cup. Anthony Edwards looked great. Why wouldn't you start a franchise with yeah. him? All right, moving on here. Uh, this is a good one. Which player is most likely to have a breakout season in 23-24? Let's talk a little bit more about Anthony Edwards. He got 23% of the vote. Holy moly. This guy was fourth, no, excuse me, fifth on uh, who you would start a franchise, but this guy's also going to break out, according to the GMs. Uh, Cade Cunningham, 20%, coming in second. Uh, a couple Magic players, Franz Wagner, Paolo Bancaro, and then uh, Tyrese Maxey sort of rounding out the top five. And then a lot of other guys getting votes. Desmond Bain, Mikhail Bridges, Halliburton, Chet Holmgren, Kyrie, huh? Jaden McDaniels, Mobley, Shengun, and uh, Zion Williamson. Um, a lot of sprinkling in this one. Yeah, and that makes some sense. But, you know, Ant at the top. I guess the question to you is, has Anthony Edwards already broken out? Or do you truly believe there is another sort of level that, that he can go to still and I guess become an all-NBA sort of superstar guy? Get him a Biore nose strip, because he has already broken out, Skeets. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember the name of the acne pads, unfortunately. Remember those? You wipe your chin, like yes. your cheek, and it's just burning. You're Kevin from Home Alone for the entire day, but... 
Oh, Maybe. what are those called? <sighs> yeah, let us know in the stream. Yeah. I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure we all had acne back in the day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I kind of think Anthony Edwards is a little too broken out. He was made all-star last year, 25 a game. He could have a Shea Gilgis Alexander-like another leap, yeah, right? Like, yeah. he can get to 30 points per game. I do think, though, it'll be tough. Carl Anthony Towns is a good scorer as well, and uh, there's just a pretty good depth on the Timberwolves, so he doesn't need to do everything. So I kind of disqualify him. I kind of similarly disqualify Cade Cunningham just because this is basically his second year in the league, just played a handful of games uh, last yeah. season. But I can understand why he would be picked pretty high as well. He was apparently great in FIBA uh, training camps and that kind of stuff. So for me, if I'm looking at pure breakout players, I do like Franz Wagner coming into his third year uh, with the Magic. We saw him looking incredible uh, for Germany uh, over the summer. The Magic should take a step forward, which I think is pretty funny to see Wagner and Paolo right after each other. Paolo was rookie of the year last year too, so I'm kind of disqualifying <laughs> him as well. I'm just crossing out all kinds of names on the breakout sure. thing here, Skeets. So for me, pure breakout Franz is a good pick. I like that one. Uh, Clearasil. Clearasil. Nice one. Shout out to, uh, who is that? Uh, UK Hugh Dean in the stream team dropping the Clearasil. That's what we were looking for. <laughs> Stridex. That was another classic yeah, one. Ooh, yeah. Noxzema. All the, the big three right there. <laughs> oh, those were my old friends back in the day. Um, I also wanted to throw a couple other names in the mix here. If we're just throwing out receiving votes or yeah. at least uh, should maybe get a vote or two. What about Anthony Simons? I mean, he's a forgotten guy, I guess, now with Lillard moving on and Scoop coming in there and Scoop looking solid sure. in preseason and all that. But, like, this guy, Ziller pointed this out in an article earlier this week that I read uh, on the plane, actually. Uh, Simon's breakout year in 21-22, that came largely without Damian Lillard uh, on the court. But then Simon's put up huge numbers again last season while Dame was probably having his best individual season of his career, too, which is pretty telling and I think we just forget that Simons is one of the best already at his young age I think he's just 24 he turned 24 in the summer he's already like one of the best high volume three-point shooters in the league like it's unreal over the course of the last two seasons Simons has averaged 8.4 three-point attempts per game I'm combining two years there while shooting 39 percent from deep that's there's I mean you can get on the basketball reference and you know throw that into stat head or whatever and you put, like, the age, you know, qualifier on it, the list is going to be short to do that over a two-year span. Now, I know the game has changed from, like, 20 years ago and all that, but, like, that's damn good. So I'm high on him, maybe still, like, maintaining that level, going up a little level. And uh, I'll also throw, you know, this is cheating a little bit because it's, like, a young guy, but Keegan Murray with the Kings, too. All the talk around him is, like, ooh, he could, like, he could, I mean, you obviously learn the ropes there. That's a good team in Sacramento. I'm still high on them. Um I could, I could, that would make sense to me too that he sort of goes up a level. I would go Murray over Simons personally. Sure. I don't I don't know what I think of Simons. I th to me it's like his ceiling is Zach Levine, it, and if he gets to Zach Levine level, two time All Star, that's a breakout. But it's hard to break out when you're on maybe the worst team yeah. in your conference or at least the team that's going to be at the bottom of the standings. I do think Keegan Murray, if he breaks out, that would be huge for the Kings because, oh, yeah. yeah, baby, we're going to be talking about Harrison Barnes trade rumors all over again, Skeets. <laughs> they got him back just to stay in the news, but you've seen what Keegan Murray did during Summer League. He was basically too good to play in Summer League, won the MVP right away. And now in preseason, he's putting the ball on the floor, getting to the hoop. That would be another huge step in his game if he's able to create his own shots rather than being kind of a catch-and-shoot three-point guy. Uh, that'd be big time for him and for the Kings. And we have someone here in the stream team saying, what about Ben Simmons? What about Ben? What about Ben Simmons? Because, you know, you see somebody throws a vote at Zion. Okay, the idea that he would stay healthy. Kyrie Irving in here is a bit of an odd one as a breakout player, but <laughs> I guess bouncing back from sort of these weird seasons he's had. So if you're going to go that route, yeah, sure. Ben Simmons. He's looking solid in the preseason. He's, he's hitting fadeaway jumpers which were blowing people's minds. And he's hitting the floor. Like, that's the other thing. He's like, wow, this guy's, like, actually trying again and appears to be healthy. So, hey, you know, I'm in on Ben Simmons. I've planted my flag on the island. I know you're on the island. Have you seen any other people join you? I They're, they're making their way over. I can see them in the distance. <laughs> There's a few people. Uh, what did Tom Hanks uh, get off uh, the island with? He had, like, a – it was like a porta potty that he, like, turned into, like, a like a boat, basically, yeah. or a sail. <laughs> boat a potty I see them coming. I see nice. them coming. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. good. There's a few of us. Uh, all right, next one here. Which team will be most improved in 23-24? I will say, not surprisingly, the Oklahoma City Thunder lead this 
from the GMs with 30% of the vote. So a few of them out there saying the Thunder will be most improved. Rockets second and all the moves they did, obviously Van Vliet, Brooks. Uh, and then we have a three-way tie for third. It's the Mavs, it's the Pistons, and it's the Magic. A few other teams receiving votes, but thoughts on this one. Most improved team, Trey. How do you judge this, I guess, is the question. Because the Thunder won 40 games last year. They would have to win a ton of games to really improve more than a team like the Rockets would in the in the the standings, right? Like the Rockets could win 10 more games next year and yeah. still be at the bottom of the Western Conference. Uh, and similar to the Mavericks, they tanked away the end of their season so they could easily surpass that uh, on wins. But I think this is just a good place to talk about the Thunder because everybody is hyped for the Thunder right now. Yes. You've seen what Chet Holmgren has been doing uh, in the preseason. That's exactly what they needed, somebody to rebound, play defense, and be a big guy for them. It looks like it's going to be awesome, and everybody's just excited to see the Thunder. And I do think that they can be a legit top six playoff team this yep. year. And if that's the case, that's still an improvement. Yeah, if you are listening to the other podcasts out there right now, everybody's going crazy about OKC. And you're like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down. But then you see them even in preseason, you're like, holy crap. Like, if yeah. all these guys, and you add Chet Holmgren, like you said, but like, Jalen Jalen Williams could be a breakout guy for all we yep. know. I know he's still young, but we love his game. Obviously, Giddy. You know there is still Dort. This this and then SGA as their superstar, who might actually have worse numbers, but that could be better uh, for the team's success. So yeah, they were a play-in team, right? They're flirting with that. Could they be a 50-win team? Could they be possibly flirting with home court advantage in a first-round series? If it all breaks right. They have the talent. It's just like whether or not it's ready to go right now and it all clicks. And and Chet is sort of the the missing piece to take them to that sort of 50-win level. I get why people are high on them. It's almost like scares me a little bit that everybody's like, watch over the thunder. Like they're yeah. going to like go, they're going to surprise a lot of people and go super deep. But sometimes it does happen. 50 wins is a lot though. I know. Two teams in the Western Conference got 50 wins last year. One was the Nuggets. Pencil them in for 50 wins. Um, yeah. The Grizzlies got to 51. They're going to be without job for the first 25 games. So they may not get They'll to 50 wins. Out. The Kings won 48 last year. They could challenge the Suns. Sure. Won 45, including a big trade for Kevin Durant. Obviously, they've beefed up their team. The Lakers punted away the first half of the season when Westbrook was still in town. They could challenge for 50 wins. It's just going to be hard to get yeah. to 50 wins for any of these teams. Yeah. Um, any other squads there on that list or maybe not receiving a vote that you're like, you could see improving? Well, I actually wanted to ask you, what do you think about the Mavs? People in the stream team are saying the Mavs improved. Hell no. I mean, they got better. I do think they got better. They make more sense as a team. Yeah. Uh, bringing in Grant Williams. Yeah, they got Batman. They got Batman, which is <laughs> good. Yeah. I guess. I mean, it depends how you feel about Batman as a superhero. Um, yeah. No, I wouldn't. I would not be throwing them a vote for most improved at all. No. <laughs> and, and to improve. I guess the idea is like, you just said it. How are the GMs looking at this or answering it? It's like, they didn't make the play-in. Yes. Like, that's embarrassing. Like, I, like I, still, we don't, like, shit on them enough for, like, literally crapping the bed and then leaning into, like, the tank a little bit to keep the pick and all that. Um, but so maybe they're just like, well, they, sh they should be a lot better than that. They should be a playoff team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's an improvement. But maybe it's not, like, in the win-loss column all that much. But, no, like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have voted for them. The Thunder would have got my vote. I believe it. I understand why they're doing it. Sure, the Rockets has a really, really bad team. Uh, should add a lot of wins yep. or more wins, but could still be bad, like you said. And then I and then I can be talked in. We do it every year. It feels like for the last five years. Hey, are you Pistons or Magic as the breakout this year? Which one are you? Which one are you? Which one are you? We're always debating that. Which one are you? I'm probably uh, well. Which one was I last year? I think I went Pistons last year. Let me flip back to the Magic this one. Good choice. <laughs> okay, Good there choice. you go. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, you said uh, the Pacers got a vote. The Lakers, Pelicans, Jazz, Warriors. So it was sort of spread out on that one. Uh, final question here that uh, or results I wanted to show everybody. Which team is the most fun to watch? 30% said the Nuggets. Warriors, 23%. They uh, led the way the year prior. You see there at the bottom. Kings, 20% of the vote. So it's really a, a three-way race, really. Nuggets, Warriors, Kings, and then some votes for the Suns and some other teams there. But Trey Kirby, which team is going to be the most fun to watch? Who would get your vote? I don't want to vote for the Kings again but I think I probably would vote Ooh. for the Kings. They are just played so fast. The offense was great. I think another uh, of the GM survey questions was who runs the best offense, and Mike Brown got it, mm -hmm. which is pretty crazy if you think about the way 
his career started and with the LeBron teams when they were like great on defense and just LeBron carrying yeah. uh, on offense with the Lakers. They never figured it out, but now suddenly they're he's the coach of like the highest octane team in the league at least last season. Maybe the offensive rating standings will change. Uh, they're just going to be fun to watch. They got a great environment. I assume they're bringing the beam back. Oh God! You it's, can't cancel the beam after one season. I would hope not. I, yeah. I think they should make the beam bigger or add another a beam. second beam. Yeah, <laughs> okay. double beam. Double beam. <laughs> add a beam every year. They make the playoffs. Yeah. I really like that. So I would have. Uh, I think I would pick the Kings. Yeah. I maybe would have the Warriors over the Nuggets. I don't know. I think that's a that's a debatable one. The Nuggets are really fun to watch, especially in the postseason, because that's when Jamal Murray really turns it on. Yeah. And he starts looking for his shot a lot more, which I think increases their watchability. The team that's too high to me though is the Suns. I feel like they're just going to be a take turns kind of team, which will be effective Mm -hmm. because they've got great players taking turns, but I don't necessarily know that it makes for the most fun watch. Like the heat weren't always the most fun watch when it was LeBron and do we, and uh, Dean Wade. I literally almost said Dean Wade. (laughs) (laughs) Dwayne. Don't send this to Dwayne Wade. (laughs) You know, I love Dwayne Wade, (laughs) but I also love Dean Wade. Uh, (laughs) But they weren't always the most fun team to watch when they First got started, you know, LeBron would kick it to the corner and Wade would be cutting to the basket. They just hadn't figured everything out yet because they don't know how to play necessarily with each other. So I think they're a little high. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you like the the mid-range game, if you like the mid-range <laughs> you're probably going to see a lot of that from uh, Booker, KD, and Beal and, and, and three-pointers that they're generating too. I mean, I get why they're getting votes because I think they're like, damn. Good luck stopping that. Like, yes, there could be some exactly. high right. yeah, yeah, yeah. scoring performances. Uh, you know, if if Nurk is doing all the dirty work that they're talking about, just rebounding and setting screens and passing out of the the high post and stuff like that, could be fun. I, I get it, but yeah, um, I'm probably voting Kings as well. Yeah, we like offense here. I like somebody in the stream team pointing out, and I'm glad they got one vote. The Pacers could be a very very fun watch if you watched Halliburton during the uh, the FIBA World Cup. My God, anytime he was on the floor, the team was much more enjoyable to watch the pace they played at and how he obviously just pushes the tempo and finds guys so i get that one i I like the pacers as at least a sneaky fun league pass team that was my team that was too low uh for sure they were sixth in pace last season that was with halliburton missing the last chunk of the season because when he plays man they're just flying up and down the court which is perfect for a team named after cars that's good good call uh all right my final question with all this uh gm survey stuff is are there any other intriguing results to you uh that that shu asked the question and we got some uh, surprising results what do you got a couple of things really interested me there's like a who's the best player at position for all of these but you're eligible for multiple positions so schumann includes highest percentage of total votes on position questions who showed up the most time sure basically it goes Giannis number one, followed by Jokic, curry booker and then luca and jason tatum tied for fifth okay you think those are the top six players in the league? I think you would have to include Embiid. Embiid is like the notable name that's missing here, but that's just because he and Jokic are only showing up as centers, right? And yeah. people are taking Jokic over Embiid, despite how the MVP voting went last year. But I think if you're talking top seven, like throw in Embiid, and those are the top seven dudes. I'd yeah, say. it's pretty pretty damn close. Yeah, Luka's a weird one, right, uh, when you get into these like – positional things i think he was a top three player at three different positions yeah yeah exactly so the gms can't decide which position luca plays he received votes as the best player at three different positions he was second most votes as the best point guard behind steph curry he was tied for the third most votes as the best shooting guard behind curry and leader in the shooting guard position devin booker and then he received the third most votes as the best small forward behind tatum and kevin durant (laughs) again this is luca Falling in the top three, yeah. point guard, shooting guard, and uh, small forward. Which one do you consider him, Luca? <sighs> That's a great question. I would have said point guard. I, I say point guard. I don't really. But now even... he plays with Kyrie. Yeah, Is he a point Kyrie's guard or a shooting, guard? A shooting yeah, guard? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and then, like, Curry's always a weird one, too. Yeah. It's like he is a point guard, but. I mean, he's the greatest shooter of all time. So you're like, well, then he's a shooting guard, is he not? I know none of this really matters, but it is funny that Luca was getting votes across all three of those. Yep. Uh, anything else? Which player is the best pure shooter? <laughs> Four players received votes. Steph Curry got 90% of the vote. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Kevin Durant got a vote. He's pure. <clears throat> yeah, he might have the best collection of shooting from deep range to mid-range game as well. So definitely he gets a vote. Damian Lillard, he got a vote. Okay. He's probably an even better deep, deep, deep three-point shooter than Steph Curry, at least by the numbers and the numbers that he has made and all that kind of stuff. 
And also Luke Kennard got a vote. <laughs> the Nard Dog! Oh, I was the like, Nard. this is ridiculous. Who voted for Luke Kennard? He shot 49% from three last year. That's pure. <laughs> That's wet. Luke is wet. Yeah, I mean... Uh, but you got to be crazy to make that pick. Uh, yeah. you got to be crazy to look at all the great shooters in the league, knowing Steph Curry is still playing, and yeah. saying, you know what? I'm going Nard Dog here. Yeah. That's yeah, and like think about the shots that the Nard Dog is taking compared yes. to Steph Curry and the attention on those two different players. Uh, but he is a great shooter. Yeah, he's. I mean, have we seen the Nard Dog in a three point contest? Has he gone in it? Probably. He yeah. would have had to. He's been like top of the league for a couple of seasons here. Definitely hasn't won, definitely it, yet, hasn't won it. And I'm trying to like maybe he's got a good shot to get, win a three point contest. He, like he's not a big jumper or anything like that. No, I mean it's like uh, I'm surprised he hasn't won <laughs> yeah. one. Yet. I'm like he's like Capono basically or yeah. something like that. Get the get the nerd dog a three point title. Um, yeah, that's uh, but that is a, that's a bit of a reach. Yes, <laughs> despite his great shooting uh, percentages. But I do I don't know like when you're watching yeah you know, all these games and you're watching league pass, there are certain guys where you're like if they're open, you think it's going in every single time. So if you're a GM who's thinking of it in that way, you're like, you're watching the league every single night. You see so many people take wide open three pointers. Who's going in the most? Maybe it's Luke Kennard, but <laughs> he's getting some good looks compared to these other guys. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry. I'm still taking Steph Curry in any three point contest uh, versus Nard Dog. I mean, it, I mean, I get in, in game action or not yes. just in an empty gym. I mean, I'm taking him, but uh, good stuff. Well, let's hear from everybody out there. Schumann, once again, knocked this out of the park. The NBA GM survey. What other sort of responses from these guys uh, surprised you? What do you Luke, got there? Luke Kennard finished second in the three-point contest oh, he did. Okay. in 2022. 2022? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he was in it. Okay. He's Pure due. shooter. Nard dogs do. Uh, let's get to a little Is This News? some headlines for Trey Kirby and for you podcast listeners and everybody joining us on YouTube either live or later smash that like button uh, first one is from The Athletic great website go to theathletic.com slash no dunks get yourself a subscription uh, this headline though I thought was from The Onion <laughs> I'm not kidding NBA says load management no longer supported by scientific data every player should want to play 82 games and that quote coming from <laughs> Joe Dumars I thought it was a joke. I thought so. I was like, oh, this is a pretty <laughs> funny idea. Like, oh, that's a great idea. I wish I tweeted that. <laughs> no, this hey, is real. New science just dropped. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me give you Joe Dumars, uh, uh, his, his sort of hefty quote here on all this. He is the executive vice president of basketball operations for the NBA. He said, quote, before it was a given conclusion that the data showed that you had to rest players a certain amount and that justified them sitting out. We've gotten more data, and it just doesn't show that resting, sitting guys out correlates with lack of injuries or fatigue or anything like that. What it does show is maybe guys aren't as efficient on the second night of a back-to-back. -back. I'll stop it there. He had more things to say, but again, that was Joe Dumars saying, whoops, I'm bad. <laughs> the data is wrong, and this load management that we've been talking about for five years at least, I mean, at least the Kawhi Raptors run. Um, That's when it... That's when it really tried. kicked off. It yeah. used to be a joke. Remember when the Spurs rested guys? DNP old. <laughs> <laughs> Little did you know, Adam, that it was going to go this poorly. Uh, but man, the science, I, that's crazy to me. Because uh, the last time we heard from Adam Silver, he was saying the data is inconclusive. But they went back and did a couple more weeks of research. And guess what? Turns out every player should be playing 82 games. Yeah. Now, why do you think uh, they're saying this now? What's The timing is a little intriguing, isn't it? Is there like a TV deal coming up or something <laughs> like that? Are they trying to maybe uh, talk to their TV partners through the press here and saying, we're play making our players play in these games, so pony up, boy. Uh, because to me, the regular season has been devalued a little bit, and everything we've seen from the NBA in the past four months has been saying, we're trying to get players to care more about the regular season. They go in the, the 65 games minimum for all of the awards. Yep. They did the player participation player participation <laughs> program protocols who cares <laughs> there's a third p there it's triple p baby yeah, triple p they got the end season tournament and now this new uh, science report just dropped though i haven't seen it yes i know john hollinger was looking for it he hasn't seen it hmm interesting um, so uh it's uh it's interesting because 
yeah, the league looked the other way with load management for quite some time. And obviously now that they're going back uh, to the negotiating table, they're hitting it pretty hard on the head right here saying we're trying to get back to an 82 game schedule. Don't even talk to me about shortening the season. And if it works, that would be awesome because I would love to see the best players play every single night as well. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny the the timing of all this again because as recently as last February, Commissioner Adam Silver, he rejected the notion that star players were missing too many games. And he said there is real medical data and scientific data about what's appropriate. Hold on, do you say data or data? Which one do you do? I know both they're both are, good. I know, I know. I think I say data. More I know. Often. I'm a yeah. data guy. It sounds weird every time I say it. The first anyway. time you said it, you, you said data. Like, I know. <laughs> the Don Dada. The new Don Dada dropped. <laughs> anyway, Silver changed his tune in September when you already said it. He said, frankly, the science is inconclusive. So that was like, you know, half half a year. He suddenly is changing his sort of mind on how he feels about all of this and star players missing games and whether it's good or not for their health or whether it matters at all. You said it. The NBA's current national TV deal with ESPN and Turner expires after the 24-25 season. That is next season. So that is not far from now. And we're talking a deal currently that's like $24 billion over nine years. <laughs> that's going up. That's going up. And the last thing you want when you're trying to negotiate is... Turner, ESPN, Apple, Amazon, whoever that's going to be in these meetings trying to get a piece of the NBA saying, well, yeah, 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 we're well, we're going to co- take a couple billion off here because you guys don't play all those 82 games. The, the regular season is not all that important. Yeah, we get it when it gets to the playoffs. But, like, yeah, that's what's going on here. And, and it's probably better. I mean, we talk to casual fans all the time, and there's a perception that it's like, oh, yeah, the season's too long. We all agree on that, but that yeah. ain't changing. And then because of that, well, these guys don't play, you know, they play 70% of the games. And which sucks for people going to games, obviously, where you're trying to see the stars. And the whole other part, the NBA made this mess. They created this entire league on the backs of their star players. That's their entire marketing. It worked. But the, then you need those guys to play when you go to the opposing arenas and you're on the big national televised games. That's how you built it. And then if that's the case, you got to continue to obviously showcase these guys and they got to be out there, you know, barring injury where it's actually a legit injury, but you can't be a rest situation. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember Silver talking over the summer saying it's kind of like it's become sort of a status in the NBA to be good enough on your own team that they'll rest you, even though, you know, you're like 24 years old and you could obviously play um, all of these different seasons. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see what the effects are, but at least the messaging right now is them saying, hey, take the regular season a little bit more seriously because last year kind of did feel like a tipping point with two teams that made the in, uh, the play-in tournament went to the conference finals. The Lakers did it. Then obviously the Heat went to the actual finals. We saw the Bucks have uh, the most wins in the Eastern Conference, but that didn't mean anything when it came playoff time. So it already feels like the regular season and the postseason are completely different games. And that's just weird. Like it just shouldn't be yeah. like that. You know? and, yeah. And I would like to like uh, hammer home this point because I know we've said it before. When I say like Joe Dumars and Silver and the league is trying to say like, hey, we got to start taking the regular season more seriously and we got to play more games. I don't mean like I'm not shitting on the players because I actually truly believe it's yeah. not generally the players saying, eh, I'm tired. I don't want to play. I don't really buy it at all. It's the teams. They're trying to protect, you know, their quote unquote assets, their superstar players. They had data that backed it up. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't check out now. But that's why. It's like they're telling the teams this. They're telling the the, yes. the, the the coaches and the staff, like, come on. This has to mean more. We have to take this more seriously. Hence this, you know, in-season tournament and all that. It's not the players. I really – maybe there are a handful out there. I don't know. But I don't think it's a majority of them. They want to play. They're hoopers. <laughs> they want to play. Yeah. Uh, so it's the, the teams play. that are being told, let's go. Let's go here. So, look, it's a culture shift and, and – uh, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, our next headline, also from The Athletic. This is from a couple days ago. The Celtics extend Peyton Pritchard with a four-year, $30 million contract. Here's another PP for you. Uh, <laughs> Peyton Pritchard payday. pp oh. What do you think about this? Is this news? Uh, yes. I mean, good for him. Uh, the yeah. guy made a trade request last year because he was basically buried uh, on the Celtics bench, but they made so many moves over the offseason, sending out two point guards in Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon. Only one came back in Drew Holiday, so there's a little bit more opportunity, which is all fast PP was looking for. Now he's going to have an opportunity as one of their key reserve guards, uh, I do believe. They'll probably want to 
pace Drew Holiday over the course of a season, being a little bit uh, older than some of the other players on the Celtics. They want him fresh for the playoffs. Peyton Pritchard did not have a great run uh, in the postseason, but I think he can be helpful during the regular season when you need everybody on your team to show up and play because even if we're not resting dudes, there's still going to be times when you need the deeper guys on your bench. He's a good three-point shooter. He can handle uh, and make some plays here and there. So I think a a good deal, Uh, but man, $40 million get you a Peyton Pritchard these days. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, $30 million. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's very, very... affordable. I mean, both the Celtics and Pritchard actually have some flexibility uh, and, of course, then security in Pritchard's case in this deal. I think it's a good, fair deal. It's almost sort of shocking to me that it happened, you know, here in the preseason. He looks solid in the preseason. You know, he's balling right now. Uh, And he has, like, look, he wasn't playing huge minutes, but he's appeared in nearly 40 playoff games for Boston over three seasons. (laughs) Already? He's been there for a while. I mean, they've made long, deep runs. runs. So... You know, there's some experience there, and yeah, he's going to be he's going to be a key player on a team that got much more shallow and went like all in on sort of top end talent in Drew Holiday and Porzingis. That means there's a role for him now, and yeah, he was complaining last year, "Get me out of here! Yeah. I'm not getting burned," and now he will. And so, yeah, I think this makes sense. Some people are like, they just don't think Peyton Pritchard's that good, and they think they think four years, thirty million is too much for a guy like him that you could probably like find somewhere else. I don't know how many times. People that are saying that are like actually watching him and what he can yeah. do. He can, he can shoot and he can create a little bit, like you said. So this makes sense to me. Good and I think here. a pretty good point by JJ here in the stream team. Tradable contract, of which course. is going to be important as we go forward into the second apron era. Yeah. Uh, next headline. Keep it moving here. Had to get your take on this one. This one, I will admit, this headline, it's stale. Okay. <laughs> it's like a week old at this point, but we were gone a lot of the week. ESPN. Has the headline, Joel Embiid to represent Team USA at the 2024 Paris Olympics. He made his decision. (laughs) You are saluting him here on the podcast. (laughs) Wow. It's come to this. You had to get Joel Embiid. We got to recruit these days, Skeets. To battle Kelly Olenek and Dwight Powell. Ooh. Damn. Ooh. I don't think that's who they're concerned about. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's uh, that guy from Serbia, Nikola Jokic. Team USA needed a center. Uh, and maybe it would have been a different choice for Joel Embiid had Team USA won the FIBA World Cup. But similar to uh, the Warriors losing the 2016 finals, which opened the door for Kevin Durant, Team USA losing in the World Cup opened the door for Joel Embiid to be like, hey, hey, y'all need me. You actually do need me. I can go here and have his best chance at a championship. Yeah. Uh, at least uh, at least in the 2024 calendar year, I do believe. Uh, so yeah, I mean... We've seen a lot of commitments to Team USA. We'll see what who's healthy at the end of the season, who's still going to be involved, yeah. but getting Embiid, uh, going into a tournament where Jokic is going to be playing, Giannis will likely be back as well. Yeah. Team USA absolutely needed a big guy, so they got a very big one. And Embiid, uh, you know, like a like a, a guy at a high school uh, deciding which college he was going to. I wish he had three hats lined three hats. up. <laughs> uh, you know, the French national hat, Team yeah. USA, and then uh, Cameroon he could play for, of course, as well. Um, and then he put on the hat. I wish we saw that. But uh, this is big. This really is truly big. Uh, if you care about international basketball and the Olympics, which us sickos do, uh, it's a huge get they're already gonna their team's gonna be 10 times better with all the guys that are saying they're in be it curry and lebron and stuff like that now you get joel and beat but they're gonna need them if they run into a serbian team with Jokic or stuff like that so and it'll definitely be a different style of play for team usa they're big guys over the past basically since 2008 have generally been smaller guys like it could be chris bosh it could be bam Adebayo. it was draymond guys who are Great defenders, switchy defenders, get the ball off the rim and bring it up court. That's not Embiid's game. That guy's going to be in the high post a lot. He's going to be in the low post a lot. There's more post opportunity scoring, I think, in FIBA tournaments, so that will be helpful. But it's definitely going to be different than Team USA has been playing and how Steve Kerr pl- teams have been playing. Like, yeah. He's never had a post-up guy like Joel Embiid on any of the teams he's coached. I do like this comment from uh, Tom Izzo here in the stream team. Betting on Embiid, what could go wrong? (laughs) Tom Izzo's watching? (laughs) That's right. Thanks, man. (laughs) Thanks, Tom. Uh, But Paul counters, Embiid will have a lot of scapegoats if the U.S. fall in the Olympics. So maybe it won't be all on Joel Embiid (laughs) once they lose once again to to Team Canada. Oh, man. It's going to be tough. Uh, I hate this, man. (laughs) I got to keep going. Honestly, I hate it. it. I hate it. Like, I 
I, never did I think that Team USA would lose to Canada, even though I knew it was a possibility. Even going into this FIBA World Cup, but now that it's happened, I gotta live with it for a year, and I gotta be throwing my lot in with Joel and Bead, man. <laughs> Tough times. Tough times. We had some podcasts, like I'm saying, ten years ago. I think it was on a podcast. It may have been off, but we had like a, we had like almost a bet. I was like, in my lifetime. While working with you, Team Canada is going to beat Team USA. And you were like, hell no, it ain't ever going to happen. And it, you know, World Cup, a little different than the Olympics. Not your best team, but come on. You're still Team America here. And you lost. I can't believe it. I mean, even I was shocked. Not even I was shocked. <laughs> it hurts, man. It hurts. So Fourth I got... place? They don't even give you anything for that. No, no. No, you, you just get, you know, embarrassed by me on every second podcast exactly. here. I pointed, I pointed it out, I think, on the last three <laughs> podcasts. Uh, final headline. This one's a wild one. NBA.com. Hornets wave former first-round pick Kai Jones. Is this news? This is news because... Uh... He's made it news, I guess. Like, this is honestly sad uh, to me. Kai Jones feels like he's tweeting and Instagramming his way out of the NBA, uh, basically trash-talking his own players, making trade requests, calling himself the GOAT. Maybe he is more talented like, or more skilled than, like, Mark Williams and Nick Richards, but being a teammate is also a huge part of being on an NBA team, and you're not that good to be trash-talking all these kinds of guys. So hopefully he gets the support he needs because this does not – feel like he's totally making the right choices here. Yeah, do you think we'll see Kai Jones in a NBA uniform? Probably. I mean, probably at some point. He's young enough right now and he's still athletic enough that some team will take him on as a distressed asset at some point, but it could be a couple of years. It could be some time. It could be the middle of the season or something like that, but that's the thing. It's like he's not that good to be talking like this because teams will just cut bait. No problem. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, look. We I don't know him personally. It feels like he might need some help. Uh, because that like uh, on one hand, when you're seeing these posts and stuff, you're like, I guess you're like, oh, that's weird or funny, I guess. But then you're like, oh, he's still doing it. He's doubling down. It's getting a little odder. And you're like, there's something off here. Like, uh, he doesn't truly believe yes. this, does he? So, yeah, hopefully he gets the but, – but, I mean, look, I say hopefully he gets the help he needs. You'd like to see him back in the league. He's a talented guy. He was a first-round pick, for crying out loud, in the toughest league in the world. Uh, but very strange how this went down with him. Look, in other weird, shitty Hornets news, uh, I guess speaking of Hornets who desperately need help here, there's a criminal summons out for Miles Bridges for violating a domestic violence protective order misdemeanor child abuse and injury to personal property bridges allegedly threw bill billiard balls at his ex-girlfriend's car damaged the windshield kids were in the car that's a child abuse charge um during this exchange he threatened her to you know withhold child support take everything from her i know he's due in court on november 13th but uh you know this guy talk about needing help and like the hornets need to I think they need Cut to him. make a decision here very yeah. quickly. Yes. Cause... I mean, it was ridiculous that they gave him a contract in the first place. It was ridiculous that the league suspended him for a total of 10 games, and it's ridiculous the way he has been acting since. <laughs> and, I mean, similar to Kevin Porter Jr., he's still on the Rockets right now. Like, Good let's point. get him out of here. Yeah, it's a great point. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> what a start to the Hornets season once again here. I'm like, yeah, no God. doubt. All right, let's, uh, let's change the mood in here. Let's get to Tweet of the Night. Mm. Tweet of the night. Wow. Twitter. I've got a few tweets for you. I thought both were too good to only pick one. First one, we teased it off the top. Channing Fry, our former colleague there at NBA TV, he had a lot to say in this tweet. Quote, I'm on a flight back from Atlanta, and I say to myself, watch the Blue Beetle movie. When I tell you it was the top three worst fucking movies I have ever seen in my life, it's no exaggeration. I could fill my dog shitting with the budget it probably costs, and it would be better. Rhino turd movie. <laughs> Rhino turd movie. Blue Beetle. Superhero movie. Uh, JD, you're usually the expert when it comes to this. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the Blue Beetle, but... Yeah, literally uh, nothing. I, you haven't honest. seen it. Has anybody seen, seen it. it here? I guess not. Mm -mm. You haven't seen this rhino mm -mm. turd? Uh, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, how bad is this? But like, Rotten Tomatoes, it's uh, like over 90% audience. Okay, whatever. And then like the critics don't mind it. Yeah. So I'm confused here. It, it. My my perception is that it's just a nice little superhero movie. It's something to take the kids to. Sure. That's it. I mean... 
I don't know what else to say. Like maybe it was the format, you know. I know this was released in IMAX, but if you're watching it on a, an airplane, the Blue Beetle isn't meant to be seen like that. It's on a tiny screen. <laughs> well, yeah, I was gonna uh, get upset with you, Trey and Skis, for watching the Mutant Ninja Turtles on the plane. Like I'm, a, you know, I, we we were talking about it in New York, and I'm like, I'm not watching that on a plane. I'm watching it at least 4K on my home screen with the cranked you know i hear the, uh, the soundtrack mu- the music's fire. awesome yeah, yeah the soundtrack's i'm actually gonna rewatch it because i thought the the mix on the plane was crazy i was feeling like jd listening with my ears i was like i can barely hear this dialogue that's here. right that's right did they say cowabunga it's because you were in the back of the plane with <laughs> the a shitter oh man. yeah hush that fuss <laughs> I mean, people moved to dropping the back rhino of the plane. turns at the back of the plane <laughs> I, I told you guys uh when we were in new york i did see the craziest thing full-grown man watching angels in the outfield on the plane <laughs> <laughs> like a 30 year old movie Let's see what Danny Glover's up to Joseph Gordon-Levitt but, is that uh, weirder than a, a full grown Aussie watching Mrs. Doubtfire on the plane every time he flies <laughs> no it's not I don't, I don't think no, maybe that's his comfort movie maybe he doesn't like to fly maybe he loved that movie as a child who? Doubtfire or Angels in the Outfield? Yeah, Angels in the Outfield oh, okay. guy. It's also, you know, baseball playoffs are happening. Good I don't point. Know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you had sort of a sort of a theory. Is it possible that Channing Fry was accidentally watching Ace Ventura 2? <laughs> Hence the Rhino Turd. The greatest Rhino Turd movie of all time. <laughs> Is it possible? I mean, it might be. For all you podcast listeners, we're showing an incredible still of Jim Carrey coming out of the ass of a... You know, an animatronic rhino. Yes, yeah, yeah. is uh, the Trojan horse rhino he was in. Yeah. I know that um, entertainment was different on airplanes back when Ace Ventura 2, when Nature Calls came out. But can you imagine sitting next to somebody watching that scene on an airplane? Oh, man. <laughs> like, wh- what? What are you doing over there? <laughs> Smashing his face through. That guy was like the highest paid movie star in the world doing that. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a good point. It's a good point. What so, are what are the three worst movies you've ever seen in your life? Oh, I mean, um, I've said it before. The only movie I've ever walked out of the theater for was uh, the Nick Cage ambulance movie, uh, uh, Bringing Bringin Out the, the Dead. dead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was not in the right headspace for that movie. And uh, <laughs> so for me, it's always been one of the worst movies ever, even though I think some people <laughs> do like it. I mean, it's Martin Scorsese, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it enough to get up and walk out. I can't believe I did that. It's something I just don't do. So that comes to the top of my mind. What about you? I've only ever walked out of one movie as well, The Libertine, starring Johnny Depp. Whoa. Yeah, it was, I've never even heard of that. It was dumb. It was it was so dumb. But uh, yeah, I walked out of that one, so that's high on my list. Yeah. Uh, there was a movie I watched when I was a kid on VHS called My Boyfriend's Back, and it's like about a zombie boyfriend who comes back, and that was a dumb, <laughs> dumb movie. And then The Happening, starring Mark Wahlberg, an M. Night Shyamalan movie, yeah. Yeah. which was one of, that was a big rhino turd, but funny. Hilarious. Yes. Yes. A hilarious Very rhino funny. turd of a movie. JD, got any uh, rhino turd movies? Yeah, well, I've head? walked out of three movies in my life, actually. There okay. we go. Terminator 1. <laughs> That's a shocker. Fucking hated it. <laughs> it was also the first movie we had, like Lincoln had just been born and it was like, we're going out. Let's go see this movie. Transformers. <laughs> like, why? Okay. Because it was the biggest movie happening. So we went to see him. We're like, hold on. Hold wait, on. You said Terminator or, Terminator or Transformers? Transformers. Transformers. Okay. Sorry, okay. My bad. My bad. My bad. My bad. Yeah. I was thinking Terminator because the other movie is an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called The Eraser. I don't know. If oh, you yeah. I remember yeah. that. Yep. I walked. I saw that by myself. I walked out in the middle of the climax of the movie. Like, it was just wow. like, you know what? I've had enough of this. He's I'm not leaving. Gonna erase him. <laughs> and the other one, the most controversial one, is um, is uh, Big Fish. Walked out of Big oh, Fish. Oh, I forgot about Big Fish. Oh, very yeah. controversial. Fuck, hated it. Hated because it. Because then you told somebody in college yeah. like we were I can picture us standing in the lab yeah. and us talking about this movie and you just shitting on it you're like this is the worst dumbest with movie with Matteo Matteo yeah. and I were agreeing and, and then someone there was like that's my favorite movie of all time yeah. it makes me think yeah. of my father or something it right. was like it was like oh and we're like rolling our eyes and he's like well is your father still alive yeah it was we're like, like oh, oh boy geez. okay <laughs> I'm gonna go to the cafeteria yeah uh, yeah yeah 
Uh, anyway, Constant. I can't believe I said Terminator 1. There's no way I would Yeah, I was reacted. like, yeah. that's why we reacted when no, no, you no. said it. Transformers. Transformers, Transformers yeah, yeah, yeah. the first one. Yeah, that was, that was and I haven't great. actually seen another one since. They've but, made uh, so many. Oh, it's like yeah. seven or eight. Yeah. Something like that. Bumblebee so they're so movie. tedious, man. Oh, my God. Anyways, that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have one more tweet here. Let's uh, slip it in here. From Rohan. This did not make the story, but I asked Jimmy Butler if he would be willing to give up coffee for a year in exchange for an NBA title, and this was his response. Hell no. <laughs> He's going stone cold. Stone cold brew. <laughs> Jimmy Butler would not give up coffee for a year in exchange for an NBA title. Are you, are you surprised by that? I don't think so. Yeah. Because I think Jimmy's saying, I'm going to win an NBA That's title. That's exactly. I'm going to win it anyway. That's so how I look at it. Coffee. He's like, why would I give up coffee? <laughs> yeah, I'm just exactly. Gonna, in my head, I'm winning a title yeah. anyway. But I mean, this is like a, it is a little bit like it's a, you know, the genie with the wish here, Jimmy. It's like, okay, <laughs> you can win a title. I'm telling you, you can win a title this coming season. You just can't drink your big face coffee for a year. You can then drink it after that. That's the crazy part. To me, it's like, should be coffee for life. Yeah. Like if you were a big coffee fan, like he obviously yeah, sure, is, sure. but it's for a year. Simple. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think he should. I think he should that. reconsider. <laughs> what if it, the coffee is holding him back? Like for oh, real? Oh wow! Caffeine is just is just doesn't. What's agree the data with... say on this, Silver? <laughs> Let's get to the lab. These guys are drinking too much coffee. Yeah, yeah. You never know. Take that for data, um, or data, <laughs> or choice. data. That's da- what I said the, the da- first time. Da- All right, great tweets. X. X is making a, a I, I got uh, X as my breakout uh, social media platform. <laughs> oh, really? That's a swerve. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Not a lot of votes. No. You guys coming in with 3% of the vote this year. <laughs> yeah, Schumann, you know, I love the GM survey. Consult with us to throw in one or two just insane questions to the GM. Like, what's your favorite social media? <laughs> like something insane just to see what they Biggest say. Biggest fashion trend this year. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Or like uh, mock turtlenecks. <laughs> 100% of the vote every year. <laughs> I think there's something there. Just one silly question to keep them on their toes. I'll tell you what I really liked. A nice touch by Schumann. They asked the question, who will be the top, the best player in five years from this rookie class? Yeah. And he includes who won the vote from that rookie class five years ago. So 2018, it was a split vote between DeAndre Ayton and Jaron Jackson Jr. Two whiffs for the NBA GMs there. Because right now it's Luka Doncic. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. And who did they ultimately go? They went. You'll never guess. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. yeah. All, all votes? I think he got 90% yeah, of the vote. Yeah, that does sound right. Uh, so 90- ch- who got it? Did Chet get a vote? Because he's... Scoot, maybe? I don't, oh, I don't remember. Okay. I definitely know that uh, Wemby got 90% of the vote. And if I'm not mistaken, that was higher than LeBron got his rookie season. I think he got 81% of the vote back in 03. Mm. That was a great gra- draft class. So, you know, people were probably talking to themselves into Carmelo or uh, Dwayne Wade as well. No votes for Dean Wade, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> you watch Wemby and Chet highlights? I did, I did. That was it was fun. These guys are cool. Man. It was a, uh, it was a lot of fun. You just start to go like my mind immediately goes to like give the NBA ten years and the entire NBA is going to be all <laughs> these seven foot guys that can do absolutely everything. There'll be no small guys anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but then it, I'm like, is there enough tall people in the world? Seven plus that we can teach basketball. I mean, really, I, I, and they I, all have to be very skinny and have some guard skills. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, if you went back thirty years and you plopped Zach Collins in the league, people would be like, "This guy's a unicorn." Look how fast and athletic yeah. he is at six yeah, eleven, yeah. and then he looks tiny compared yeah. to both Chet and Victor. But man, the fact that these two are like going to be matching up four times a year for at least the first what seven years of their career. We'll see where things take them eventually, but. That's exciting, man. Seeing these two guys obviously like caring about going against each other and just like Magic versus Bird, they have history dating back to their amateur years, yep. uh, even before they got to the NBA. That was a preseason game. I don't really watch preseason games, but I was hyped to at least see the highlights. Yeah, that's generally my rule, too. I'm not sitting down to watch an entire preseason game. We have too much basketball coming up that games actually matter or hopefully matter more, obviously. Uh but the highlights, yeah. That's what I mean. You just you start getting pumped, and you start like, well, like not even just Chet versus Wemby, but like we talked about, like Jalen Williams on the Thunder and how they looked, and 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 a couple other guys. Like Scoot looked great, uh, and and just so confident yep. out there. And you're like, yeah, you're like, all right, here we go. So, it's right around the corner. Just to tie all of this together, here's a question we got to ask the GMs: What's the biggest Rhino Turd movie of the year? <laughs> <laughs> See what they say. 
Leave it open for interpretation. <laughs> and uh, maybe Schumann can get that in next year's NBA GM survey. Okay, let's call it there. The boys are back. Like I said, come Monday, we're going to kick off our season preview series, uh, doing deep dives on a lot of the teams. We'll do over-unders. Like, we got a lot in store. Make some predictions when it comes to awards. I mean, we're basically going to be doing our own GM survey, you and me, all the stuff we're going to be trying to predict here. So that'll be next week. 10 o'clock a.m. live from the Classic Factory all week long. And then the week after that, the season basically starts. Can't wait. So join us, subscribe, like. If you're a podcast listener, leave your boys a five-star rating and review and share the show. Tell your NBA fans or friends <laughs> about this show. Later today, if you're a Survivor fan, we're still here. I'm gonna I'm gonna fire up some lunch. I got some mashed potatoes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's it. Just mashed potatoes? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I got a My guy's one. going close encounters of the third kind. <laughs> You're gonna, a psycho. I'm going to eat some lunch, and uh, we are going to still be here in the Classic Factory at 1 p.m. Eastern to recap this week's Survivor episode, which was a banger, an incredible ending to the episode. So JD, myself, and Trey will be talking about this. Esh won't be with us because that guy just had a baby yeah. yes congrats to ash and his wife on uh their fourth child that's right four wow <laughs> this guy. new kid kid no doubt <laughs> my goodness so congrats to them everybody's happy and healthy so uh it'll just be the three of us here talking about survivor no buffs has its own youtube feed its own podcast feed so we'll see you over there until then or if you're just an nba fan until monday clipper bro you heard it here first have a great time turn up love you guys awesome Thanks for joining us, and remember, the best Jim Carrey movie I've seen recently is the clip of him on stage with 50 Cent when In the Club was really popular, and, you know, 50's doing his thing, performing the song, and Jim Carrey is acting exactly like you would expect Jim Carrey to be doing, just like, (laughs) shaking his head around all crazy. (laughs) Why are they on stage together? It was 2009. (laughs) Embrace the day, people.